Well, I'm so proud of our network team. The network's performing incredibly well. Data traffic's up, obviously. Um, but what's really up is minutes of use is up by a third. Uh, picture messaging is almost doubled. Gaming has doubled. Uh, video conferencing, obviously, more than doubled. Um, what's happened, of course, is the network has moved, too, during times of day have changed and also locations. People are using it much more in the suburbs, obviously less in urban areas. And all through it, our network is performing better than ever before, uh, with less congestion and higher satisfaction rates than ever before. Our net promoter scores just hit an all-time high, even though this uh, pandemic is unfolding and people are relying on that network. We're really proud it's standing up to the need. What about user growth, Mike? Given that most stores are closed and everything is sort of on hold, can T-Mobile continue to keep up its share gains that it historically has seen and has helped the stock and helped the business? Absolutely. You know, I, we're five weeks into this merger, and amazingly, we had to pull it off during this global pandemic and this incredible situation. And I'd say that, if anything, these five weeks have taught us that there may, if anything, be more synergy potential in this business and more growth potential than we saw before the transaction closed. Um, one of the fuels of that growth and that synergy potential is uh, churn over on the Sprint side. You know, as more and more of those Sprint customers get exposure to the T-Mobile network, and we've turned on nationwide roaming, their satisfaction levels are rising. And we may see an improvement in the Sprint customer base faster than we were expecting. We may also see other improvements faster than we were expecting, including network synergy attainment, retail synergy attainment, procurement attainment. So, you know, five weeks have taught us a lot. Obviously, we're dealing with some incredible issues, but there's nothing uh, but but momentum behind the potential of this business in the medium and long term. But we got to work through these COVID issues in the short term, and that's for sure. Mike, you mentioned the network's holding up well despite a big increase in, in usage. Does coronavirus alter the timeline and need for the rollout of 5G if things are holding up well, but there's going to be a pinch on people's spending and they may not move to a 5G-enabled phone as quickly as before? Does that give you more time to roll it out or, or not? Well, it may, may very well. You know, one of the things that's so great about this combination is that the new T-Mobile is finally able to break down that trade-off that customers have had to make since the beginning of time, which is, do you want a better value or a better network? We're going to be able to deliver customers both. And I got to say, a better value right now is really resonating with people. And I think as social distancing starts to come to an end here over the next few months and people get back at it, I think we're going to be facing economic circumstances that cause people to question whether or not they're getting the best value. And T-Mobile will, will be there to stand up for them and give them what they're really looking for in the marketplace. And so that gives us a lot of potential strength. I think it's interesting, Mike, that, that you talked about finding more synergies when it comes to the merger. But what about delays? I mean, it, it, there has to be projects on hold, marketing campaigns, for instance, joining stores together, uh, just a merging of this business and the execution that that's going to require as a result of COVID-19, isn't there? You know, it could, be, it could go the other way. For example, we say, see the potential to rationalize our retail fleet, if anything, potentially a little bit quicker. Um, we've had so many of our stores closed down, um, and that has allowed us to address when we reopen how we reopen in a way that maybe is different than it would have been without the crisis. Uh, the network deployment is proceeding apace. You know, that hasn't slowed down a bit. And to the premise of your earlier question, um, you know, there may even be potential there uh, to move faster as we've moved hmm. more sprint traffic onto the T-Mobile network faster than we were expecting to. And that may allow us to move faster to, to get this combination done than we were expecting. So, you know, we're not here to make any predictions, but you know, five weeks in, we're seeing a lot of optimism and we feel a lot of optimism about the potential to go faster than we were expecting and potentially to go bigger than we were expecting on both growth and synergy attainment. Mike, uh, I wonder how you think about your, your main competitors. Your, your predecessor uh, used to have a nickname for, for Verizon and AT&T, which was Dumb and Dumber. Do you, do you have a nickname for them? What, what, what's, how, how do you think uh, about them and, and how they compare to you? Well, why on earth would we ever give up that nickname? You know, um, and by the way, you know, our overall growth this quarter, it's so great, again, to compare to AT&T and Verizon. Our service revenues of $8.7 billion we're up 5.3%, an all-time 
record high. And that 5% growth was more than twice the growth rate of either of those two other guys. Uh, and so it's no wonder they were fighting so hard over the last two years to try to keep us from merging with Sprint so that we could create this spectrum portfolio that now, and get this, this spectrum portfolio in mid-band and low-band is double, just about double what uh, AT&T has and almost triple what Verizon has for similar sized customer bases. And so we've got the tools and the raw ingredients to bring a level of competition to those guys they've never seen. So two specific questions on that from the analysts that they want to know. One, can you close that margin gap with Verizon? And two, can you start to, now that, you know, with this bigger number three competitor, start to win over bigger corporate accounts? Uh, yes and yes. You know, the long-term aspiration that we communicated for this company was margins in the mid-50s, and we still see that. In fact, as I said, we see the potential to move there faster, perhaps, than we were expecting when we first announced this transaction back in 2018. So margins in the mid-50s uh, would produce an enormous return uh, for the investors in this company as we grow uh, into it and take share from AT&T and Verizon. So I, I see a ton of potential there. Th those guys clearly are your... your your long-standing rivals, uh, Mike. I, I wonder whether in a couple of years' time, once 5G has been fully rolled out, whether you'll be just as much competing with fixed-line cable providers. Is that the way you see the industry pivoting? Will we only uh, need one subscription if 5G really is as, as brilliant as some of you guys suggest? Well, we see an enormous potential to compete. And by the way, that is the least competitive market on planet Earth. There is so much potential to bring a level of competition to cable, and they're not prepared for it. You know, at least the wireless guys have faced competition for years, and it's a fair fight. But the cable guys don't even know what competition looks like. Uh, this 5G network will allow us to market in-home broadband through radio waves in 52% of U.S. zip codes over the next few years. So we're going to move very quickly to try to seize that opportunity and bring lower prices and better connections to millions of customers.